company, Samsung Science, will hear genetic diversity and extinction. Now here's the story of the giant rice rat. It was about the size of a regular cat. On an island in the Caribbean, it was like a long vacation. So the science today we're going to look at populations with reduced genetic diversity face increased risk of extinction. I need to explain why genetic diversity is important for species survival in a changing environment. So first we're going to go through a few definitions. So genetic diversity refers to the variation in the number and types of genes present within a population. So if a species is highly genetically diverse, there's a large number of genes spread across its population. But then the question is, what is a gene? Well, a gene is a section of DNA that codes for a production of a protein or a gene product. So over here we can see in our cells we have a nucleus, if you're a eukaryotic organism. Those chromosomes are made up of long stretches of DNA, and sections of DNA that code for a particular protein are called a gene. So this gene here is coding for this protein, or it's a very small protein. This gene is coding for this one, and this one is this gene is coding for this protein. So a gene is a section of DNA that codes for a protein or a gene product. Then we have alleles. So alleles are different forms of genes. So here we can see in corn, different alleles are active, and that leads to the different colors of the kernels. So over here we can see this difference again. So here we have flower color, for example. We have an allele for purple flowers, and an allele for white flowers. Out of those two alleles, we're going to get the purple flowers expressing, for example, maybe over the white flowers. So the alleles are the two different versions here, the purple allele and the white allele. You would have done this hopefully previously in year 10 in genetics. You would have had a look at different alleles in your, say, mother and father, looking at things like eye color, where you can look at dominant and recessive alleles. So each of those, they're different forms of a gene. So mutations cause different forms of genes. So there are changes in the DNA sequence, and that leads to different forms of genes. So here we can see a point mutation. So this is one letter change. So DNA is made out of a four letter code. That sequence of the four letter code tells your uh, cells what kind of proteins to produce. If you change the code, you might change the protein. You might make the protein work in a different way. It might work better or it might work worse. When that happens, that change in sequence, we call that a mutation. So over here we're looking at a type of anemia called sickle cell anemia. So we have a sequence here, which is GAG. We get this mutation in the A here to turn it into a T. So rather than having GAG, we have GTG. That changes one amino acid in a protein, and that one change in the amino acid can stop the protein from working properly. And our final definition here is a phenotype. A phenotype is what you see as a result of an expression of a gene. So uh, we talked before about blue eyes and brown eyes, so this is the phenotype. The genotype is what genes you have, so which alleles combination you have. The phenotype is what you see. So let's talk about high genetic diversity. A gene pool is the sum of all the genes available to a species. And here we have a picture of dogs, so we're going to talk about dogs again later. Um, in dogs you have a wide variety of genes, lots of different alleles, and all those genes are available to other dogs since they are quite a diverse species and they have large amounts of genes. So this is a big gene pool. Over here we have a frog gene pool where we have really only three genes here that we're looking at in terms of phenotype, green, red, and purple. So this is a much more limited gene pool. Species that have high genetic diversity, they also have a greater number of alleles in their gene pool. And this gives those species an extra chance of surviving when the environment changes. So since you have a wider variety of genes, you also have a wider variety of phenotypes. If the environment changes, so there's a greater chance that a particular phenotype benefits, then that phenotype will survive and therefore reproduce, um, and they can survive that change in the environment. So if you go from, if you, your species has genes in it that allows it to survive a change from going from you know, lush and green to deserty, then your species will survive and pass on those genes that allow it to survive in the changed climate um, onto the offspring. If you have low genetic diversity, then you don't have as many phenotypes available, and that means you're less likely to be able to survive the change. So let's talk about an example species with high genetic diversity. They're the domesticated dog, so Canis lupus familiaris. They have a greater genetic diversity than that of their closest relative, which is the wolf, which is just Canis lupus. So domestic dogs are a subspecies of uh, wolves. Now, a key thing here, though, is within a breed of a dog, there is very low genetic diversity because you're breeding in particular aspects that you see as beneficial into that breed. If we look at the French Bulldog, for example, down here, the amount of genes within the French Bulldog breed are going to be quite small because they're all going to be very similar as the breeder has selected those specific traits that they want in their dog. But if we compared all the dog breeds together, as well as mongrels or uh, town dogs, for example, who have uh, wide varieties of genes because they haven't been selected into a particular um, breed, there's really great genetic diversity here. Because of this great genetic diversity, dogs are very successful in many different environments all over the earth.
And part of that is due to breeding, and part of that is due to their high genetic diversity. Now, species with low genetic diversity, they have fewer alleles available in their gene pool. So again, if we look at our frog example here, we have lots of greens, one red, and two purples. The reason why there might be low genetic diversity is there might be few individuals of the species left. Those individuals that are left might be closely related, or it could be a combination of both. This leaves these species particularly vulnerable to change in the environment and extinction. If we look at our example down here with the frogs, so we've got the green, the red, and the purple. If the environment changes so as to advantage the red, then all the other frogs are going to die out. Now, gene pool is going to be made up with only genes available to the red frogs. So the gene pool goes from this diversity, where we've got at least three colors, down to one. So that's an advantage for the red frog, but if the environment changes again, and there's no other genes available, then the species will die out. One of the effects of this is, as the population dips, their genetic variation dips as well. Now, the population size might recover, but the variety of genes might not, since mutation takes a long time to make its way through a species. So you might have a large population, but the genetic variation might be quite low. And again, this is an advantage if the environment changes. Due to the facial tumor disease that Tasmanian devils have been uh, suffering from over the last 15, 20 years, the number of Tasmanian devils has reduced significantly, and this has also reduced the uh, genetic diversity in there because there's fewer individuals and fewer genes av available. So they're going through this at the moment, so there's fewer individuals and there's also fewer genes available. So this can lead to inbreeding. The problem with inbreeding is it reduces the genetic diversity and it also increases the potential for unfavorable alleles to become more common um, in the population. So to explain it over here we have some snakes. So we have a dominant allele A, which is good, and we have a recessive allele, lowercase a, uh, which is deleterious. This means it's bad. So here we get some inbreeding. That inbreeding increases the chances of you um, getting the two alleles of the lowercase a, and that will kill the snake. It won't be able to pass on its genes then. Whereas if you breed out with non-closely related individuals, the chance of that occurring is quite low. This happens in humans too. So here we're looking at Charles II. Charles II of Spain is a result of inbreeding all the way through the royal houses of Europe. He had what's called a Habsburg jaw, which is a, a phenotype that popped up a few generations before him. There's interbreeding between uncles and nieces, first cousins, uh, second cousins, and here's the result of a relationship between an uncle and their niece. These people are very closely related. That means there's fewer new genes coming in. That means your chances of getting this uh, deleterious double uh, recessive allele is quite high. Charles II uh, didn't have a very good life, he wasn't fertile, he had a lot of disabilities, so he wasn't a very successful monarch. So let's talk about genetic or population bottlenecks. Both human activity and in the past natural disasters, these can cause a rapid decline in the number of individuals. When this happens, only a few individuals will survive the bottleneck, and those individuals that survive, they'll carry a limited number of alleles, and those alleles become the alleles that are shared by the surviving population. This decreases genetic diversity, since there's fewer individuals, at least initially, and the, those individuals that have survived have fewer alleles compared to the parent population before. So let's have a look at this image down here. So here we have our original, original population. We've got blue and white marbles and also some yellow marbles. They're making their way through the bottleneck, and only a few make it through, and the surviving population only has blue and white marbles. So we're using marbles there in terms of alleles. So here we can see what happens. So we have a population size, we have our bottleneck event, this could be something like a change in climate or the introduction of humans. That reduces the population, and as it reduces the population, it also reduces the alleles within the population and the gene pool. Now the population might recover, but it also might go extinct. Since there's fewer individuals and fewer genes available, um, inbreeding depression can increase, and this reduces the ability of the species to survive. So an example of a species with low genetic diversity is the cheetah. Cheetahs are very highly related. You can take a skin graft from one cheetah and apply it to another cheetah and it will survive quite well. There's about less than 1% genetic diversity between two individuals and cheetahs, which is very low compared to, say, humans. Their bottleneck they went through was about 10,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. Very few individuals survived. So those individuals passed their genes on to today's cheetahs and since there was very few individuals with very few genes that were different between them, they're very highly genetically similar. Now this is an issue as well because there's few individuals today due to human activities and this means the chances of inbreeding are higher and that means there's very little genetic diversity and that leads to the probability that they won't survive very long in a changing environment with human pressures. There's not enough diversity in their genes to lead to genetic diversity in phenotypes to allow them to survive. So part of preservation efforts for cheetahs is trying to find distantly related cheetahs to have babies with each other so that we can increase the genetic diversity in the remaining cheetahs. Low genetic diversity, a limited gene pool, leads to an increased 
risk of extinction. So the reasons for this are because, again, in the changing environment, you have few alleles available, so you have few genes available, you have fewer phenotypes available that might be able to succeed when the environment changes. And this is a big issue when you try and reintroduce a species that might have gone extinct. This is called de-extinction. So a good example of this is the Tasmanian tiger. So we have a few Tasmanian tigers that are stored in jars um, often babies, but there are a few adults, so we can get their DNA out. Now, the DNA hasn't been preserved particularly well, but it is there. If we brought an individual back, it would be genetically identical to the individual from which we got the DNA from, but since the breeding stock would be very limited to the cloned individuals from what uh, DNA we have remaining, it would be very highly genetically similar. And this would lead to large amounts of inbreeding depression and probably not very successful breeding. This could be attempted, for example, with woolly mammoths. We have elephants, which are reasonably closely related. Uh, we have DNA from woolly mammoths available. But again, the reintroduced population would be very low in genetic diversity, so it's unlikely to be successful over long periods of time. So now on Flipping Science, we looked at genetic diversity and extinction risk. That's it for Flipping Science today. See ya! <laughs>